you've got a soybean field where it's planted in late May, it's early July, and soybean cyst is a parasitic worm. And at this point in the season, you can usually see the white females show up on the roots if you have SCN. So I would encourage everyone to get out and take a look. And that's exactly what we're doing this morning. So I've got a graduate student with me, Brian Hansen out there. He's digging roots and we're gonna take a look at this. So what Brian's doing here is he's got a trowel and he's very carefully digging up the entire root mass. And if you do that, you can lots of times see these white females that will stay on the roots. So Brian's got some up and what he's looking for, are not the big nodules, the big nodules that are easy to see, that's a normal healthy soybean. But on the, on the lateral roots lots of times, and sometimes maybe on the main roots, about 10 times smaller, you'll start to see these white SCN females. And what you're looking at here is the female worm filling full of eggs. And so from the, the cycle, it'll go about three times in the summer where you have these eggs hatched, they'll form SCN, they'll attack the roots, they'll, they'll form eggs and then they'll reproduce. And so it'll go through about three cycles. So early July really is a good time to take a look. And we've got quite a few on these roots. When you get close, what you're looking at is really cream colored little lemon shaped lesions that lot, they're lemon shaped cysts that really, you almost need a hand lens. Most of us need a hand lens to see them clearly. So Brian found a really good example of an SCN cyst compared to a nodule. So on the left side is a nodule, nice healthy nodule, pretty normal nodule. On the right, you can see that small cream colored, maybe lemon shaped if you have really good eyes. That's the SCN cyst. And so that cyst is probably full of 150 or 200 eggs of the nematode. So the reason SCN is such a problem is because of that cyst structure. That cyst structure is really, really tough and it's full of eggs. And the way SCN moves across the state, and you know it's been moving since 2003 here, is, is with soil. So those cysts will survive when soil moves. So when you see soil moving through the wind, through water, through equipment, anything that moves soil is going to be moving SCN. And the North Dakota Soybean Council has been really progressive in trying to figure out where SCN is in the state. And they started a sampling program back in 2013 where growers could take a sample bag with the program they could do some sampling like Brian's doing at the end of the season, and they could send that soil into the lab and they will cover the lab fees. So the producers can do this. They get their data back in the mail. It doesn't cost them anything. And NDSU gets enough data so we can create a map. So we don't have any farm information, any names, anything like that. But what we do have is egg counts and where they occur. So the maps that you're looking at are the result of work from 2013 until now. And so you've got about 4,000 samples that have been pulled in the last seven years. And on the map, you can see that those black circles, those are negatives and the gray boxes are inconclusive. But really, any of those colored circles, squares, diamonds, they're real. And when you get up into the yellow and the red, those are over 10,000 eggs per 100 cc's. And that's a lot. That's going to cause damage on even the best resistant soybean variety. The most important time to sample is in the fall. And so you want to think about fall sampling sometime before or after harvest. That's when the SCN population is the highest and easiest to detect. But what's really important is how to manage it, especially in the southeast. So we know we can manage it. We've got genetic resistance. We've got crop rotation techniques. We've got some seed treatments. And putting them all together in a system to use is really what we need to do. One more thing I want to talk about SCN. We do have genetic resistance, but it's, it's all from this line PI88788. 95% of the resistant soybean varieties have this. And it's been grown widely across the US in the last, the last two decades, really. And you can imagine what would happen if you put the same mode of action herbicide on a soybean variety across the US for 20 years, right? Things change and the nematode is adapting. So one of the things that's really important is to try to figure out what your egg levels are and start moving those management tools around. If you can get a, if you can get a PI8878 variety and rotate it with a Peking-based variety, you're going to be much better off in the future. Awesome video that we just got done showing. You had a really good photo of the entire state of North Dakota and, and where the samples had been taken and, and showing us some of those egg levels out there. And I really want to focus, what are we seeing right here in Steele County? And I, I think we have a map that we could pull up to, to show our growers today what, what kind of uh, egg levels we're seeing. Yeah, you're kind of on the leading edge, I guess I would say. So we know we know SCN is moving from the south to north and east to west. I mean, basically it's moving with anything that moves soil. 
And so we first found this in 2003 in Richland County. And of course the Red River flows north. So SCN started, it basically had a train of water to move north. Uh, and then slowly it's been moving west. So a lot of the movement is in flood water and wind. Uh, a lot of the more distance movement is, uh, is caused by soil on equipment. So anytime you have any soil on any piece of equipment, you're moving it through the county or moving it into the county, you're gonna bring whatever you have in the soil also into the county. And that could be SCN or pathogens or weed seeds, you know, we've seen a lot of that. So you're kind of on the leading edge. So there's, a, there's an area here that I would say the county is almost split in half or maybe kind of a corner to corner into half. And so you've got a fair bit on that east. It's not, you don't see a lot of those red little pentagons that you saw in the, in the first map. You know, there's a couple right on the top that you can see. Those are really high levels. But I would say that any of those colors would be concerning because any of them over time will cause yield loss. Now on the other side of the county, there's a lot of negatives. A lot, of, remember those black circles, they're negatives and the little gray boxes, I call those inconclusives. And this was just because it's such a low level of eggs and other nematodes live in the soil. Other things can lay eggs. <clears throat> so it can be hard to tell them apart. So I would say there's almost a dividing line uh, corner to corner in the county. And of course that will change over time. So Sam, this is something, like you said, it's in the soil, we can't see it. So even though we can't see it, can you talk a little bit, what's the damage that this nematode does below ground? I mean, how does it impact soybean yield? Yeah, soybean cyst is kind of sinister. I mean, honestly, it's, it's an unusual thing, right? So you have, a, <clears throat> you have a parasitic worm and the goal of the worm really is not to kill your host. So imagine I have a tapeworm or something, you know? I mean, if, if I die, that doesn't really help the tapeworm, right? So soybean cyst kind of functions in the same area. So what it does is those females go into the roots and they set up, essentially, it's like a little buffet table. They, they parasitize the cells and turn it into basically a feeding structure. We call it a syncytium. But over time, they just continually feed and feed and feed and feed on the roots. And you often don't even see above ground damage in the soybean plant until you're taking about a 30% yield hit. It's quite remarkable. And at that point, they'll start to turn yellow and they'll be, they'll be uh, stunted and they'll just kind of not look right. But you can't tell what's going on. So, but basically, they're just feeding on that soybean plant. They're just taking energy, nutrition, water, everything out of that plant. And their goal is not to kill it. Their goal is just to parasitize it. So Sam, when would we see <clears throat> this actual, if we got to the point where our egg levels were so high, when, we'd, when would we start to see that symptomology? I mean, we get, I get calls from growers saying, jeepers, you know, I, my soybeans are really going yellow on me. And it always depends on that time of the year because it looks so similar to IDC or iron chlorosis. So when, when could we possibly see symptoms if we get to high enough egg levels? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's really important for growers to, to think about this too. So the short answer is that probably mid-August or later, that's the short answer, but there's a reason for it. So when you have SCN, it goes through a whole life cycle, egg to little juvenile worms that you can't see, becomes a cyst with eggs, and then they can rehatch and that cycle can turn. So in North Dakota, we probably turn two or three cycles, probably three in a lot of cases. So we've got three cycles of that thing turning. And each time the egg levels are doing this, they're coming up. So you have parasit parasitism happening early. You know, it's not helping the plant for sure, but usually, it takes a couple months of that before the plant really starts to suffer. And so when I'm looking for SCN, if I'm looking for visual symptoms, it's almost always August or later. And, and actually we don't really recommend sampling in the middle of the season. There's a lot of activity going on. We would recommend sampling for eggs at the end of the season or even in the beginning, but the middle, we don't see as much happening. Now that's the point where of course you can see them on the roots. You can see these little white females I have to, I hate to admit it, but like I crossed that point now where I have reading glasses. <laughs> so I now need a hand lens as well to see them. So they're pretty, they're pretty small. Um, but yeah, so that, that's what happens. So it, I, and actually this is maybe a good, a good thing to mention that most soybean diseases that we worry about work on, we really don't see 
until August or later. We see root rots, but nothing else interesting from a pathology point of view happens until August or later. It sounds like you need to be proactive instead with your varieties and your rotations and things, things like that, because by the time you can see the, the influence, it's too late. There's nothing you can spray or do or, or anything with soybean cyst nematode, right, Sam? Yeah, it's all preventative. It's all preventative and planning. You know, one of the things that was really difficult and, and kind of they're still suffering in a way, in Iowa and Illinois and Indiana, is they really got behind the eight ball. The first time they really started to see SCN, they maybe had egg levels 10 or 20 or 30,000. That's a lot. That, that is really difficult to get those egg levels down. So we are in a pretty good position in the county still where we have a lot of zeros and a lot of really low levels. So if you find those early and you plan ahead, then you can incorporate genetic resistance or crop rotation and you can plan it out and you're, you're probably not gonna take nearly the yield loss that like some of, some of our southern, southern, some of the I states did early on, or even in Richland County when we first got it. And I think there were some maps too that you had, Sam, that, uh, that show kind of the, the three counties next to each other. Maybe we could bring up one of those. And you know, why are we seeing such high level, levels of eggs kind of on those borders of Steele and Trail County? Um, is there any rhyme or reason to that? That's a great question. I was perplexed by this as well. And one of the growers I was talking to maybe a few years ago, I don't remember which county I was in, but the grower said, and he was looking at the whole North Dakota map and he said, you know, it looks like the worst levels are following the beach ridges. And I thought, yeah, it makes sense, right? So, you know, SCN tends to like lighter soils. It tends to like higher pHs. It's moving up and down and up and down the valley with all the flooding and stuff, but it tends to do more damage when it's not flooded out you know, a little bit drier, it's the lighter soil thing as well. And so I suspect that producer's right, that you have this really high area of movement in the Red River Valley and on the beach ridges, you tend to get a little bit more damage. That's my, that's my guess, but I, I think I have to thank the grower for, for that. I think, and I think that's probably correct. And, and Sam, one of the other topics that I actually had an agronomist talk to me about is in some of those areas where, you know, we in Steele County may not necessarily have sugar beets, but as you've noticed, and you get on the trail side and a little north of Steele County, you, you hit the nail on the head when you talked about soil movement, right? Because when it comes to um, those beet tailings got to go somewhere. And what are those beet tailings covered in? They're covered in gobs and gobs of soil. And so when those get spread out into the field, I, I really wonder if that, like you said, you know, SCN moves with soil and, and that could maybe be a, a reason why we're seeing some higher levels as well, because we're, we're transferring soil pretty easily in that situation. I think you're right. Anything that moves soil, <clears throat> there's a lot of soil movement in some of the crops. And um, yeah, we, we see issues develop over time and they've seen issues with other soil borne pathogens in other areas, other parts of the world. And a lot of it is related to soil movement and we've got a lot of it in the valley. So we've, we've already got about five minutes left, Sam. This has been a really awesome discussion. I, I love talking SCN. And, and so is there anything else that we missed? The one thing that I think everyone probably needs to wrap their head around is that dry edible beans are susceptible to SCN. Now, pintos and navies are not quite as susceptible as a soybean, but they can cause an increase in egg reproduction. And so grow quite a few dry beans in the area. So this is an important thing for not just the soybeans, it's important for the dry beans too. We don't worry about any other crops in the state. You know, they're all good rotation crops, but I'm a little concerned about dry beans. Kidneys are about equivalent to a susceptible soybean. Blacks are, tend to be resistant or moder moderately resistant. So they tend to be pretty good. And the Pintos and Navies are in the middle. They kind of are in that MS, moderately susceptible group, maybe moderately resistant. Sam, what type of crop rotation helps reduce SCN? SCN is an interesting beast, right? So that cyst is really tough and it can protect those eggs for about a decade, okay? So you can't just rotate like, I don't know, wheat, corn, wheat, corn, wheat, corn, and expect SCN to go away, it won't. What, what really has been most effective is if you have a, let's say you have a whole bunch of eggs, you've got soybeans in the crop, you know you got to rotate out, go into a non-host, so it doesn't matter if it's wheat or corn or sunflowers or you name it, anything but dry beans. So go out for a year or two, and that population will crash by a half or a little bit more. Even with one year, it helps. It'll crash by half or a little bit more. But then when you go back into a resistant soybean, 
you won't get an increase in production. You just kind of flatline, but you get all those eggs to hatch, right? And so the egg levels will stay about the same and then rotate out again. And then you're gonna have another crash of your egg levels. So really you can use just about any crop except dry beans and soybeans, but you just don't wanna go completely away from them. You gotta flesh out the eggs. You gotta make them hatch essentially. Thank you so, so much, Sam, for joining us this morning. We really appreciate all the work you've done and, and keep doing for our Steel County growers. So thanks for joining us. Thank you.